Good evening. Have you ever had a dream? But a dream so vivid, so real, so powerful, that you actually thought you had experienced it? What do you think would it take to transform that dream into a goal? And that goal into reality? The answer is just one word. It takes passion. <laughs> so I'm passionate about mountaineering and exploration. And after summiting some mountains in my native Argentina, uh, about 15 years ago, I decided to uh, initiate this project. It was a dream, the dream of climbing the seven summits, the highest peak on each continent, and to go to the North and South Poles. So this is the geographic location of the mountains. Uh, South America, you have a Mount Aconcagua in Argentina at 7,000 meters. North America, you have Mount McKinley or Denali in Alaska. In Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro. In Asia, Mount Everest. In Europe, Mount Elbrus in Russia. In Oceania as a continent, the Karstens Pyramid. And finally, in Antarctica, Mount Vinson. In addition to that, in the next 15 minutes or so, we'll do a quick trip around the world visiting the North and South Poles. So the first peak was Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Unique mountain because in seven days or eight days, you go through different geographic zones every day. Jungle, rainforest, then it's a lunar landscape with boulders and sand, and finally you hit the ice cap. We had to connect with the Maasai people, and they guided us to the uh, slopes of Kilimanjaro. Summited the peak. Actually, I summited the peak with my wife, and we climbed together four of the seven summits. So that's a test of love. <laughs> Second peak, we went to Russia, visited Moscow for a few days, and then we flew to the Kabardino Balkaria region near the Georgia border in the Caucasus. A very cold peak, very, very cold. We really experienced uh, severe temperatures here, and after several days of climbing on ice, we reached the summit at 6,000 meters above the clouds here in this picture. Mount Aconcagua in my native Argentina is my training ground. I summited this peak nine times. It's a perfect mountain in, to prepare for Himalayan conditions. You have high altitude, wind, glaciers, rock climbing, ice climbing. And you, you can spend three or four weeks climbing this peak, gaining a lot of experience, testing equipment. So after several expeditions to this peak, I gathered a small team, some friends from Argentina, another friend from California, and we planned our trip, a trip to Everest. So we needed more experience in Arctic conditions. So we decided to go and climb Mount McKinley in Alaska, in the Arctic. So we took a small airplane from Talkeetna and flew to the mountain. We landed on skis in a, in a glacier. And the pilot said, well, call me back in three or four weeks when you're done. I will pick you up if the weather is good. <laughs> I said, well, that was reassuring. <laughs> so we, we follow this, uh, this route that you can see on the screen here. And we had to walk about 50 kilometers for seven days, pulling heavy sleds with about 100 pounds on the sled, 30, 40 pounds on the backpack, carrying equipment, doing a carry and cache technique, coming back to descend, the descent to lower elevations to sleep, and going up the mountain as well to do our acclimatization to the altitude. After almost a month of climbing in the ice, we reached the summit. The thermometer was showing 55 degrees below zero. It's an alcohol thermometer. And the wind chill was minus 70. We just exposed our face just for a few seconds to take some pictures. <laughs> there is a topographic benchmark, as you can see in the photo, from the US Geological Survey showing the elevation of the summit. So after all this experience, we felt that we were ready for Everest. So after a year and a half of preparation, some extra training, we went to Nepal. 
to climb the south face of Everest. You see here in this picture, from base camp to camp one, this is the most dangerous part of the mountain because you have to cross the Kumbu ice fall. It takes six to seven hours to, to cross the ice fall. You need to cross 60 or 70 ladders, aluminum ladders. It's a very dangerous place. The ice fall moves about one meter per day. From one, camp one to camp two, it's relatively flat. There are a lot of uh, crevasses in the glacier. Camp three is located in, a, in an ice wall. It's almost a vertical ice wall, so you have to chop a platform to, to spend the night there. Camp four, and finally the summit. So we flew to Kathmandu. Kathmandu is a very interesting, a, a colorful city, and as you can see in this picture, they have different electrical standards. <laughs> Somebody from Atco Electric here. So I took a small airplane from Kathmandu to look like it's about a 40-minute flight, and we landed in this airstrip that is 35 degree slope. So gravity helps to stop the plane. <laughs> And on the other side of the runway, you have a 700 meter drop. So it's a very intense landing experience. <laughs> and what usually climbers do when I did that, we went to a small hotel to change our underwear. <laughs> so we initiated a trek from Lukla to Everest Base Camp in 12 days, visiting different small Nepali villages. There are no roads around, so you have to use these trails to carry everything. We wanted to also help the people in Nepal. So beyond the climb itself, we donated some laptop computers to school in the area and thousands of toothbrushes to a hospital. This system was used to cook and to prepare some hot water at base camp, a parabolic solar cook. And uh, you can boil a pot of water there in about 10 minutes. Visiting beautiful places, took pictures. Uh, the this town is called Ferishe, very close to base camp. And finally, we reach uh, Gorakshep. This is the last point before Everest Base Camp. It's about two hours. And it's the last point where you have Wi-Fi and some internet connection and a cell phone tower. So the first few days, we had to go two hours from base camp to Gorakshep to send an email and back another two hours. So think about that when you're in the office in the morning, opening your Outlook, and you see the little wheel, and you get desperate you know, for 40 seconds. What's going on with Outlook? <laughs> So we're at base camp, and uh, we deployed our technology. Everything was charged using solar energy. And interestingly enough, one of our sponsors was a standard charter bank from Singapore and Hong Kong, and they developed an app to do mobile banking. <laughs> the app is called Breeze. So we performed a world record, a highest banking transaction on Earth from the summit of Everest. So we tested our phones. The Sherpas did a puja or blessing ceremony, blessing the equipment, and then we were able to enter into the ice fall. So we started climbing. We enter into the ice fall, usually during the night at 2 a.m. for six hours. So we exited the ice fall in the very early hours in the morning. The ice towers are very dangerous. Everything moves, and you never know when something's going to fall. So you have to act quickly, climb fast, and keep going. There are about 60 ladders, and the ice towers are constantly moving. This place here is called the Popcorn Place. And back in 2014, 16 Sherpas were killed in an avalanche here. We had to report our position on the radio every hour at uh, to base camp. And if you want to have an idea about what it feels to cross a ladder, Take a look at this. Sometimes you can't see the bottom of the crevasse because it's so deep. This, this was about 20 meters long. It takes a few seconds to cross. And sometimes your crampon gets stuck on the ladder. We have to do a maneuver to unlock the cramp on keep going. We have two ropes and the ladders are very flexible. Sometimes we got avalanches coming from Nupsi 
and the world shoulder of Everest at the same time while crossing these levels. So here you have an idea about the landscape and the sea and all the security we had to use to negotiate the ice fall in six hours. Here you will see the overall area. Now you can breathe again. <laughs> so we crossed more ladders and as I said, sometimes we got some avalanches coming just to keep our adrenaline level quite high. <laughs> Finally, we got camp one. We had to do three rotations. We crossed the ice fall six times in total to get acclimatization. Ice, uh, uh, camp one is, is a very safe place. We put the tents in, in between two big crevasses. That's for safety purposes. If there's an avalanche coming, the avalanche will end up at the bottom of the crevasse. We moved to Camp 2 after several days and started climbing towards Camp 3 on the Lotsi face. Lotsi face uh, is an ice wall, it's about 800 meters tall. And we climbed up to 7,400 meters and I had to inflate my mattress to sleep. That was a problem because it took me like 20 minutes because of the lack of oxygen in the air instead of one, one minute here. So we chopped a platform and uh, established our Camp 3 and at that time, we saw the summit of Everest and the plume of ice because of the, the, the jet stream is always blowing there. So we enjoyed the, the view, the landscape, some climbers passing. And many people ask, what do you do with your mind to keep climbing because you are beyond rescue? At 7,400 meters, helicopters cannot fly. The air is too thin to hover around and perform a rescue. So you are beyond rescue. What do you do with your mind? So we put all our energies, all our efforts, our focus on our circle of influence or control. We try to expand the circle of influence and minimize the circle of concern. We put our energy to be prepared for the weather. We didn't worry about the weather. Can we control the weather? No. Can we prepare for the weather? Yes. Are we properly hydrated? Yes. Are we properly fed? Do we have enough equipment? So we expanded our circle of influence and really reduced the circle of concern. That's the way we kept going in those conditions. We were ready to climb the yellow band. There is a rocky section, very dangerous, near Camp 4. We got a weather forecast saying it's going to be windy, but not too bad. Well, in the upper areas of the Lotsi face, we got a wind storm. We got a radio message saying that the jet stream blowing on the summit of Everest split. One branch went to China and Pakistan. The other branch, we got a message, is going your way, descending the Lhotse face. That was a problem. So we regrouped and we kept climbing. It took us another eight hours. No water, no food, nothing. Just go, climb. Slowly, steadily, together, we went up. We reached Camp 4. It was very windy. We had to stay two days at Camp 4, at 8,000 meters. We tested our oxygen equipment. We performed some banking as well, by the way, you know. <laughs> Just to be sure the bank account was fine. We tested everything and finally we got the go-ahead. So we started at 7 p.m. on May 18th. And at 5 a.m. or so, I took this picture where I felt I was exiting the planet. It's like you're going into space. I felt that. You're so high. You clearly see the curvature of the Earth from that point. Mount Nupzi, that is almost at 8,000 meters, is so below you. This is Mount Makalu in the middle of the photo, the, the fifth highest peak on Earth. And this is the shadow of Everest, projected hundreds of kilometers over the Himalayan valleys. Around 6 a.m., we climbed the Hillary step and the final pitches in a very sharp ridge. And at 7 a.m., I reached the summit of Everest. Beautiful day, I stayed there for 40 minutes, taking pictures and video recording. And there is a photo of Sagarmata that for the Sherpas is the mother goddess of Earth, Nepal flag and Mount Makalu. Then I took the highest selfie in the world. 
and the Nepal flag and Mount Makalu. We, st we started the descent, we performed the banking transaction, everything went well. <laughs> and here you see our Camp 3, our tent, in a platform on ice. So you can see the perspective of the mountain going down. So we descended the mountain in, in several days, and in our way down to uh, Lukla, we stopped at the hospital and donated thousands of toothbrushes. The kids were very happy. <laughs> also, we brought back some garbage abandoned by old expeditions. <clears throat> the bank developed a health and wellness campaign for 87,000 employees around the world, promoting the expedition and healthy lifestyles, you know, being more active, eating healthy. So after Everest, I thought, well, now what, what's next? So I learned that at the North Pole, there was a person organizing a marathon. So I thought, that's going to be cool. You know, I should go. <laughs> so I, I registered. And I went to, I flew to a very remote island in Norway, and then to a Russian camp floating in the ice, another interesting landing. And I ran a 42-kilometer marathon protected by Russian guards because of the polar bears around. You don't want to be chased by a polar bear, right? So it took me almost nine hours to complete this marathon. 42 kilometers in the ice, extreme conditions, very difficult to, to complete, pressure ridges, and you're drifting, constantly drifting. You don't feel that, but at your GPS will show between 100 to 500 meter movement, depending on the ocean currents and the wind. So many people ask me, how was it? I have only one word to describe it. It was cold. <laughs> so we reached uh, the North Pole, and we took this picture. It's very difficult to get. 90, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The real North Pole, just for a few seconds, because then everything is, is kind of moving around. So I carried the Grand Prairie flag to the North Pole. So after the, the marathon, I decided that I had enough for ice and cold. I had to go to a tropical destination. So you may think Punta Cana, Jamaica. I went to Papua New Guinea. It was an expedition to the Stone Age. Uh, this is a different peak. It's rock climbing. It's about 1,000 meter difference in elevation. And you have to walk about 100 kilometers in the jungle to reach that point. So I visited a few houses, you know, huts. And then I met some friends. <laughs> and I, I'm always trying to bring back stuff home, you know? Uh, so I, I proposed at work to, to use this as a dress code for casual Fridays. <laughs> But the idea was rejected. <laughs> so the natives guided us through the jungle for 100 kilometers, crossing bridges in swampy terrain, wearing rubber boots. So finally, we reached base camp and started climbing their, their vertical rock under rain, hail, sometimes snow. There's a Tyrolean traverse at 5,000 meters. So you have to be hanging there on the ropes for about 10 minutes to cross this. We continue climbing, and finally we reach the summit of the Karstens Pyramid, highest peak in Oceania as a continent. We had to rappel for about five hours to base camp, and then another 100 kilometers on rubber boots on swampy terrain. Very interesting experience, very unique experience connecting with the natives. We couldn't really talk in, in English, but uh, we shared almost three weeks in the mountain and we learned a lot, and vice versa. Very, very unique experience. So after this, I had my final expedition to Antarctica to climb the highest peak in Antarctica and to go to the South Pole. So I took a Russian cargo airplane, and I landed in a blue ice runway, another interesting landing. <laughs> then I took a small airplane and landed on the skis on a glacier and started our typical routine of pulling sleds and establishing camps and carrying our food and gas and ropes, and started climbing the, the wall. And you can see here the, the slope, it's almost you know, 75 degrees between the shade and, and the, the sun. After a few days, we reached the final camp and the summit of Mount Vinson at 5,000 meters in Antarctica. Of course, I carried the Grand Prairie flag as well. <laughs> And I descended the mountain, and the people at the base camp, a few group, they knew that I was completing my seven summits, so they waited for me with a bottle of champagne. 
So in seven summits, I drank the bottle, and 20 minutes later, I was loaded into this plane. <laughs> Returning to Union Glacier, that's the main base, in preparation for my South Pole ski trick trip. So I had to wash some clothes. So I said, okay. Uh, they provided some warm water, I did the, the washing thing. I said, how am I going to dry this now? Well, in Antarctica, when it's about 50 below or so, you just hang these things outside. In 20 seconds, the solid frozen, and you see ice crystals being developed. And in about one hour, the ice crystals just blow away and you have dried clothes. It's called sublimation of the snow. No electricity. So we were dropped at about 140 kilometers from the pole and started pulling sleds and, and doing our routine for seven, eight hours per day, slowly advancing towards the South Pole. It was like being in a different planet. After seven or eight hours skiing, this is the condition at the end of the afternoon, you have to maneuver like 20 minutes to remove all the ice from your face inside the tent. The tent is quite cozy but it's very windy because of the catapatic winds. The South Pole is at 3,000 meters of elevation with winds descending towards the coast. And this is sleeping mode. So you have to prepare to sleep and you have to cover absolutely everything. If you sleep inside the tent and the temperature is about 25, 30 below, with exposing your skin, then in the morning you will have frostbite. So you have to cover absolutely everything during the night. Navigation was a, a challenge, and here you see in four pictures, zero, 90, this is 180, 270, and back to zero. So we use a system uh, measuring the magnetic declination between you know, the true south and the magnetic south, so we navigated with compass and GPS, and we had to call the uh, Amundsen Scott station at the South Pole to uh, measure to confirm, confirm the declination, we ran some calculations and we kept navigating. So uh, with some good luck we hit the kind of the pole. Uh, we saw the American base and there is a kind of a crystal ball, chromium ball at the South Pole. So we reached that point with the Grand Prairie flag. <laughs> and the geographic South Pole is about 10 meters from the ball. And reaching this point, I completed, after 15 years, my seven summits and two poles dream. So this brings me almost to the, to the end of the presentation. So if we're going to remember just one thing about this presentation tonight, I want you to remember that everyone has their own Everest in life. So climb your Everest with passion and you will be able to inspire, to lead, to influence, and to achieve great results. Remember that passion is what keeps us alive. So follow your passion and success will follow you. Thank you so much.